Should all the acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should all the acquaintance be forgot and days of old lang syne? For old lang syne, my dear, for old lang syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for old lang syne. Now there's a hand, my trusty friend, and gives me a hand of thine. We'll drink a right good willy wout for old lang syne. For old lang syne, my dear, for old lang syne. We'll drink a right good willy wout for days of old lang syne. The song I just sang is called Old Lang Syne, uh, it means something like, for old time's sake. Uh, I wrote a book about time and nothingness called The Ignorant God. I don't mean that title in any negative way. I mean that this is, there's an idea of a God who doesn't know he is God. So can you imagine that you are actually engaged in creating a universe, you're observing the creation of the universe, but you're not aware that you are the one doing it. What we call time is a bizarre thing and I believe time is not part of the physical reality but rather that it is an element of the mind that you and your mind when you think you project time outward into the world and this is why you perceive change in the world. It is the thinking minds that cause the change and therefore we think we observe time. Time is so strange as uh, German philosopher Martin Heidegger pointed out. A historian, when he uses the word time, what does he mean by it? He means the, uh, the sequence of events. In the year 1815 such and such a battle took place in France and then in 1816 this and that king in Turkey rose to power. Uh, so this is a, a chronology, chronological time. But when a physicist speaks of time, he means the measurement of motion. A ball rolls from this side over to this side and it takes six seconds and we measure it exactly six seconds. Um, and there are other concepts of time such as, for example, to have a good time. Having a good time is an emotional expression of time, meaning it was fun to be there, it was cozy. And so you see that we use time, the word time, the same word in very different contexts. So then, what is time? What is time? There are now people, and I'm part of these, these, this movement, saying that time perhaps doesn't really exist. That time is not part of the physical universe. How exactly, for example, did we even get to determine what a second is? The Greek people in ancient Greece, they didn't have seconds. They had uh, early in the day, in the middle of the day, and late in the day, and they had the night. And that was it. They didn't even have hours. They didn't divide the day up into 24 hours, and the hours into 60 minutes, and the minutes into 60 seconds. We in the modern age have invented the seconds. And we have invented minutes. And how did we do it? Most people don't even understand that. They think that, you know, minutes, times, and dates, and months are real, like April is real. No, April is made up. May is made up. June is made up. It's all made up. The years have been made up. You can even cheat. If you are uh, truly powerful, for example, uh, and living in the Middle Ages, and say you're officially living in the year 629, but you would like to be crowned in the year 1000 to make yourself seem special, what do you do? Most of the people in the Middle Ages in Europe were illiterate. What do you do? You simply proclaim 
that now is the year 1000. Most people didn't even know it was the year 629 AD since Christ. And so you tell them now it's the year 1000 and they believe it. So you've changed, you've changed the year. So I'll tell you now how, how we got to have seconds. Physicists looked at the motion of the Earth around the Sun. One revolution they called a year. And then they said, let's divide the year up in 12 months. And let's give each month about 30 days. Sometimes it's 28 and then February is 28, right? And then some, some months have 30 days and some have 31. And then let's divide the days up into 24 equal segments called hours. And the hours into 60 parts we call minutes and the minutes into 60 parts we call seconds. It's all made up and it all relates to the motion, the movement of the Earth around the Sun. That means this type of time is always related to motion. Time equals motion. And the fact we did it this way, say uh, that we linked our modern sense of time to movement is a materialist invention. It has something to do with the politics of Marxism. Yes, yes, our modern time concept has something to do with Marxist materialism. Marxist materialism says that everything in motion, everything in existence in the universe is matter in motion. Matter in motion, like the earth revolving around the sun. Matter in motion denies, if, if everything is matter in motion, it denies the existence of a soul. It denies the existence of a consciousness. It says that your brain, your thoughts are just the urine of your brain. Um, meaning don't trust your own thinking, it's just nonsense anyway. Don't do what I'm doing right now, thinking about time. Just follow orders, an hour is 60 minutes, that's all you need to know. You don't need to know why we did it that way. You don't need to know that uh, our modern sense of time was invented by materialists. Never mind. They also say we don't have a free will. They say that every, if everything is matter, then all those things that we say are not matter, are not material, must therefore not be real. It must be superstition. In fact, there's a whole uh, skeptic movement who are, in fact, not really skeptics because they never question materialism. They are materialist skeptics, meaning they only question the things that are not material. They never question materialism. Uh, the, the same problem arises in the scientific community Scientists, like the skeptics, also never question their science. They don't question the fact that modern science has been based on materialism. And materialism, again, is the belief that everything in existence in the universe is just matter in motion. Meaning, if it's not matter, it doesn't exist. Free will, uh, conscious mind, uh, a soul, a spirit, a god, perhaps, all of these things are discarded, dismissed outright like can't be real. I, however, oh, someone who was also raised in the scientific materialist worldview as a teenager, uh, I have come to question this belief. I don't think time is a quality of the physical universe, but of the mental reality, meaning a spiritual reality, that it is all in here in the mind. Uh, this connects, for example, to Albert Einstein's famous formula, E equals mc squared, the theory of relativity. But I've noticed something about Einstein's equation. You don't need to be a physicist to understand what I'm about to tell you. But remember the materialists, they said that everything in existence is matter in motion, progressing toward, yeah, accelerating toward utopia. But Einstein's formula, e, equal, e equals mc squared, matches precisely this materialist view. E in Einstein's version, it is energy. All energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. That's matter in motion. Mass times the speed of light squared, that's, ma that's motion. Right? It's mo matter in motion. So it's the same thing that Marxist materialists always said. And E equals mc squared. The squared means it's accelerating. It's accelerating toward a certain point in time where the materialist socialist utopia is supposed to materialize. You can match the two beliefs. Everything, energy, equals 
matter, mass, in motion, speed of light, accelerating toward utopia, squared. So you see that Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein did not come up with an original formula that he thought of himself. No, he simply borrowed Marxist materialism's underlying assumption, uh, went with it, and then went to look for observations he believed proved his equation right. I believe that's not real science. In real science you observe something, a certain phenomena, and then you go and try to hypothesize what it's all about, experimentally. I believe that the way that Einstein and others eventually came to prove that the theory of relativity was supposed to be true is actually based on a very clever scientific fraud whereby you literally produced a certain phenomenon, a certain observation, and then claimed that the observation you created uh, somehow proves your theory right. Uh, that's not how this works. So the point of this video is not to convince you that I'm right. I just want to show you a very different world where we assume that there is a spiritual reality. So personally, I believe there is a spiritual reality and there is some way to argue at least that this may indeed be the case. And it can be that uh, a spiritual or mental reality exists along a physical reality or that there is only a mental reality that produces the illusion of a physical reality. So I'll give you an example of, the, um, uh, of Russell's teapot analogy. Have you heard of it? Um, a guy named Russell said, imagine there is a teapot floating in a space between uh, Mars and the asteroid belt or between Mars and Earth. What is the likelihood that this teapot is there? He says, well, uh, it is not very likely that there is one unless Elon Musk or NASA shot a teapot into space that is now floating around us. It is not very likely that so far we've left behind a teapot in space. So Russell then says, well, if the existence of a teapot in the space between Earth and Mars is not likely, then, he argues, therefore, it is also unlikely that God exists somewhere between Earth and, as if God were sitting somewhere on a throne between Earth and Mars. Say, if there's no teapot there, then there's no God there. The problem with Russell's teapot analogy is that it is a materialist analogy. It assumes that everything in existence in the world is matter in motion. It assumes that God must be material. But what if we let go of that assumption and we say that, well, there can be a God who is not material, not like a teapot, not tangible. So now imagine this. In order to make their equations work, scientists have to assume the existence of dark matter and dark energy. In fact, scientists say that most of the energy in our universe is dark energy. This is strange. It means that scientists must assume, without evidence, the existence of some mysterious energy in the space between Earth and Mars and everywhere else in the universe. They call it dark energy or dark matter. They have no uh, proof that this exists. They can only assume it to make their equations work. Now, if scientists have to assume the existence of dark energy, may we not also assume the existence of God? Isn't the existence of God as likely as the existence of dark energy? I'd say it is. And that opens the possibility for an actual spiritual reality. So in that book I mentioned, The Ignorant God, I also go into the uh, the nature of the nothingness. I conclude that there is no such thing as nothingness, that there was always something rather than nothing. That is because the nothingness can be invalidated simply by the existence of the infinitesimally smallest unit of something. As long as there is something, no matter how, uh, no matter how uh, uh, tiny it is, if it's there, it has cancelled out the nothingness. So here's a thought experiment. What kinds of universes can come from nothing? Scientists say 
that uh, our universe, our physical universe, came from nothing with a fixed set of laws of physics and immutable constants that are knowable to scientists who go look for them. They even believe, scientists even believe that they're almost there, that they've almost discovered all of the, um, uh, of the laws governing our universe. Uh, and they say then that this universe is physical and perfect, perfect in the sense that it is elegant, that the formulas governing our world are elegant, like E equals MC squared, and therefore there is no spiritual dimension. Our universe is a physical material universe that came from nothing. And they say this is possible, that even though the chances that our, uh, uh, the, our physical laws and constants came into being at random is extremely small, it is almost, almost infinitely impossible for this universe to have come from nothing like that. They say it is possible because, well, the nothingness spawns other universes as well. It constantly spawns new universes and all of those other universes probably failed. And that only our universe is the only one that, that managed to have the correct uh, configuration of laws and constants and this is why we exist. I counter this argument as follows, that there is another qualitatively different type of universe that may come from nothing. And that is not a physical universe with physical laws and constants like ours, uh, at least that's what scientists claim. There is another one that is the mental universe. So imagine a universe from nothing that is not physical, but just a thought. A thinking universe that continues to think itself up. A universe that imagines the laws, but doesn't fix them in stone. A universe that doesn't have constants, a universe that is constantly changing its own constants because it is thinking itself up. This type of mental universe doesn't have to start perfectly at all. A mental universe can start in a very flawed manner, then use its thinking ability, its mind, to improve itself and to establish itself into, for example, our present state, the present state of our universe. Is it really so that this universe is physical or is it possible that the universe we are living in is a dream and that it is being dreamed up by a mind or minds producing the, the illusion of physical reality? Here's a problem for the scientists who believe that our universe is physical is that indeed it is almost infinitely impossible for this physical universe to come from nothing with the perfect constants and laws at random like that. Whereas a mental universe could come from nothing all of the time and succeed almost all of the time. The likelihood that our universe therefore is a mental universe is far greater than the likelihood that our universe is physical. That is because a mental universe doesn't have to have perfection at the start of it. A mental universe doesn't have to have perfect laws and constants. It can be a flawed universe that learns, I call it uh, by trial and error. You learn through trial and error just the way a kid learns, a kid learns to ride a bicycle. Trial and error. You fall, you get up again, you fall, you get up again. You try harder, you try slower, you try more control. And at some point you master riding a bike. Is it possible that an ignorant God, without really knowing what it was doing, that it was able to kickstart a mental universe where God and the universe think each other up or using their minds to produce reality rather than it being a freak accident of nature where our universe simply happened to be the right one with the right constants. And of course, if you are living in a mental universe, then some qualities of this universe must not be physical, such as time. Time, I believe, is an aspect of the mind, of thinking minds. It is whenever thinking is time, not motion. But see, can you think of something that cannot be destroyed? An indestructible thing that cannot be torn, that cannot be erased, it may be forgotten. And that is a thought. A thought cannot be set fire to. 
a thought cannot be shot. A thought cannot be uh, torn in half. It cannot be erased with an eraser. A thought is not a material thing. Our hands are, and the skin and the nerves that we use to touch with, our, our noses, our mouth and our tongue, our ears, all of our senses have some physical connection, right? Except the mind. When the mind thinks, a thought, a thought isn't actually physically present in your brain. Oh, they say it's neurons. No, it's not. No, it's not. A thought itself is not encoded by neurons. It is not physical. Thoughts are not physical. Time is not physical. And perhaps the universe we live in also isn't physical, but rather spiritual. Uh, I watched this video by a guy named Sverage. I'll link to his channel in the description. And he had a video about time doesn't exist. And I agreed to the extent that time doesn't exist, namely not physically. It's not a physical part of the universe. And that means all the scientific formulas that scientists have ever concocted that include time, for example, E equals mc squared includes time. C is the speed of light. That is a, a certain speed, a certain distance per second. A second is an arbitrary uh, an arbitrary unit. I told you about the seconds and the minutes and hours, how we made those up, that relates to the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Time there is uh, an, still an unproven assumption, meaning that E equals mc squared contains the illusion of time. It depends on the illusion of time that may not be real. And Einstein never proved the existence of time. He simply assumed it, just as he assumed the materialist worldview must have been true. Einstein was, a, was not a genius, he was a man of illusions, he was a magician. Now, I don't mean to bash the scientific method that is a way to explore the physical reality or whatever appears to us as physical reality and learn about it, how it works. That's one thing. But the scientific worldview that says everything is just matter in motion, that is probably a, a great fiction. Why then do scientists, supposedly highly intelligent people, buy into this fiction of materialism? The answer is the answer is the status, the social status of the scientist himself. The academic who wishes to be seen as a professor, uh, to be looked up to by his students, also to be uh, called upon by uh, captains of industry and even by presidents. Um, they want to win prizes, the Nobel Prize. It's a evidence of personal praise that you've done something well. The whole scientific industry tailors simply to the materialist or to the material provisions of our societies. We need to eat and drink and clothe ourselves and that entire machinery, the physical machinery, um, also providing heat to our homes and so on and so forth, digging for gas and oil, these are all uh, the physical needs that people want to see meet, met. And it is for this reason that the scientific worldview has become so popular. That is, with 8 billion people on Earth, we have become overly dependent on the material industry and therefore we must subordinate ourselves to the scientific worldview, which is materialism. But not all people live like this. There are still so-called primitive tribes elsewhere in the world who don't have such a massive materialist industry. Even though our world, the material world, wants to include them, and there's a reason for it, to grow the economies. But they don't want to be included, and, uh, and many primitive tribes that still exist today uh, haven't been included yet. They've been in contact. We've given them, uh, you know, shoes and phones and mirrors and, and toys, but they haven't, been, haven't exactly been included into the economic systems of the world yet. Uh, those peoples, those peoples, they spend about two hours of their time, two hours by our measure, right? They spend about two hours a day of their time hunting and gathering, and that's it. The rest of the day is spent on developing their personalities, their soul, their minds, the connections with their gods. We've given this up. We have given up on our spiritual lives in exchange for, for example, the fact that I'm filming this with an expensive camera. 
All right, I came here on a mountain bike. I have another GoPro over there. And what that means is, is that modern man has become so dependent on technology, he ends up working for it. And no longer for the development of his self, his soul, his personality, his mind. This is why I argue using this technology, I'm arguing against technology in the sense that we should not make ourselves so dependent on the material world. We should stop being materialistic. And that means we should learn to give up on things that we no longer need. <clears throat> and if we do that, if enough people do that, we might return humanity back to a more spiritual and a more meaningful life. 